Check, check. One, two, one, two. Two. Check, check. Check, check, check.
espacio para mí hablar estando de pie. No, 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 no hay problema. Bueno, entonces para, para eh, bueno, déjalo, déjalo así. Entonces, siempre me toque y yo me paro por acá. Creo que algunos están aquí para webcast y los otros no tengo idea. Los micrófonos están vivos ahora para de que eh, no, están funcionando. Hola, ya yeah, sí, están puestos. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, if uh, people could uh, take a seat and thank you for joining us on this. Uh, day that is difficult in meteorological um, sense. We actually had many more people are, who had RSVP'd, but we're pleased that you could make it. I'm Cindy Arnson. I'm director of the Latin American program here. It's a pleasure this time as on all other occasions to, to welcome you. Um, we are all familiar, I think, especially people from the World Bank, the IDB, the IMF who are in this room. We're all familiar with certain key aspects of the narrative about political economy in Latin America and the Caribbean over the last 15 years or so. Um, at the, and at the risk of oversimplification, I'll simply run down um, some of those major trends. The first was the huge spike in demand, mostly from China, not only from China, for the region's commodity, energy, and food exports over the last decade that made average growth rates in the region soar, particularly in South America. We know that there were a variety of effects, um, but South American economies boomed. There was also throughout the hemisphere the ad um, adoption of cash transfer programs that had been pioneered in Mexico and are now president, present in virtually, um, in some form, in virtually every country um, of the hemisphere, and that helped contribute to the dramatic reductions in poverty and the fact that tens of millions of people um, left poverty as a result of these multiple um, phenomena. There was also a parallel increase in the growth of the middle class, as the World Bank and others, the OECD, have documented. Um, even if the largest class of people, if you will, um, as Augusto has pointed out in earlier um, publications, um, consisted of those who had escaped poverty but were still vulnerable to falling back. And then related to that was that there were gains in the reduction of inequality, which is measured by the Gini coefficient. This was in part because of CCTs, some of it because of the expansion of, of labor in formal markets, um, and in a very small number of cases, a uh, country like Uruguay, um, um, progressive tax reform. And now we're facing the hard part. China's economy has cooled, commodity prices have fallen, um, in some cases dramatically. We've all, I think, in, certainly here in Washington benefited from um, the halving of the price of oil and gasoline in the last six months. And as a consequence, or impartially as a consequence, that just last week the IMF um, reduced its projections of regional growth for 2015 to just over 1 percent. I think it was 1.2 or 1.3 um, percent. So we're here to discuss what um, will happen in this um, current situation um, and whether there will be continued progress or the ability um, to maintain the reductions in inequality and maintain the other social gains from the so-called golden years. Um, and even as we do this, this new report that, that uh, Augusto will be discussing that came out last fall, published by the World Bank, has suggested that the estimates of how much inequality fell in the region in some ways may be exaggerated um, because the wealthiest, um, those at the highest uh, deciles of, of, of income, um, are simply not represented in household surveys. So that the, what we thought was the good news may not have been such good news after all. Um, we have um, two extraordinary people to um, present today, Agusto Latore, who is the chief economist for Latin America at the Caribbean and the Caribbean at the World Bank, previously the president of Ecuador's central bank um, with a number of important posts, and um, Angel Melguizo, who joins us 
uh, from Paris, from the OECD, which has published its annual economic outlook for Latin America um, and the Caribbean. Angel worked previously in the IDB, in the Spanish um, government, and a number of other posts. Their formal bios um, are available on the table outside. Uh, as well as on our website. And I'd also just like to mention, um, even though you may be juggling your, your lunch and, and a drink, that the, that the um, PowerPoint presentations that we will have today from Augusto and from Angel will be on our website. So they'll be there um, for you to consult after the event. So without further ado, Augusto, thank you for joining us. Well, uh, is, it, is this working? Um, if it's not, use this. Try this one. Better this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia, for uh, the invitation to speak at the Wilson Center and for all of you to brave the weather and be here. So I hope we can uh, uh, have a, an interesting conversation on a, on a very uh, important topic for Latin America. As I think all of you know Latin America has had uh, uh, the the reputation of being one of the most unequal regions in the in the planet and it continues to be but uh, it uh, it experienced kind of an unexpected good news that income inequality uh, showed a very significant dow downward trend over the last 10 years and uh, it, this is one of the few times where actually you have had this coincidence or lack of coincidence where uh, there, there was a growth spurt and inequality fell. In fact, if you were to look at the long history of inequality in Latin America, as documented, for instance, by John Williamson, now at Harvard, his point is that more often than not, inequality ha in Latin American history has tended to rise during growth spurts. So we have a, a, an unprecedented historical fact in two dimensions. First, inequality fell even as growth uh, picked up, and second, uh, uh, inequality fell. <laughs> so <laughs> this is quite remarkable for, for the region. Of course, people are asking the question, what will happen with the inequality trends under this lower growth environment? Uh, and uh, nobody knows. I don't know either. But I think one can begin to uh, speculate as to what may happen if we understand better what did happen. And the point of the matter is that we know what happened, but we do not know why what happened happened. We know that inequality fell. We don't really understand why, what were the dynamics, were those dynamics permanent, are they uh, transitory, are they subject to change under the current environment. So I'm going to focus on, on a little bit on, the, on trying to give you the sense of the puzzles, what we know and what we don't know. And so uh, since I don't have a lot of time, I'm going to jump quickly some, uh, this, is, this is the fact, you know, inequality has uh, fell in Latin America and that's rather unique. Uh, a recent paper by Leo Gasparini comparing uh, emerging markets shows that it actually fell in other emerging economies too. But uh, the intensity of the decline in income inequality was the biggest in Latin America. So the fact still states that it is a fairly unique uh, issue, uh, uh, a fairly unique development, and in contrast with, with much of the world where inequality is actually increasing and the concern about rising inequality is intensifying. So it's rather unique. I have two questions in this presentation. One question is, is it true that it fell? <laughs> I mean, there are good reasons to think that it may not be true. Remember that we report inequality based on something called the household income surveys that we use in Latin America. Latin America is really a great place to do work uh, on, on social trends based on household income surveys. One of the great achievements of the region has been that we have put together this household income surveys and now it's they are very rich, we have long histories, we can do a lot of work. But household income surveys have several problems that people have raised and therefore one has to ask whether the uh, the story that inequality has fallen is more a function of how we measure it rather than a function of the reality. There are four reasons why you may have some doubts about this. One, lack is unique in using household income surveys to measure inequality trends. Most of the world uses household consumption services. 
So you have a comparability issue from the start. Inequality tends to be lower when you look at consumption than when you look at income. We in Latin America look at household income, first point. Second point, household income surveys do not include the very rich. They don't like to answer questions and they don't participate in the survey. So you have a huge gap and, uh, and therefore one may have the impression that one is telling only part of the story because much concentration of income may have happened at the top. Third, income comes from various sources and increasing in a, in a region that's becoming more middle class, more income comes from capital, from investing in the banks, putting your deposits in a bank or investing in a mutual fund or saving for retirement, etc. So that income is not reflected in the household income surveys. And since capital income accrues mainly to the rich, one can suspect that maybe we're measuring uh, wrong. And finally, uh, this is a technical point, but there's an important point. When people look at income inequality, they look at nominal income inequality. So the assumption, the underlying assumption is that the income of the poor, the purchasing power of the income of the poor is similar to the purchasing power of the income of the rich, which is the same as saying, as assuming that the consumption basket of the rich is the same as the consumption basket of the poor. So one should ideally want to measure the inequality of purchasing power, not the inequality of nominal incomes. So those are various reasons that people have put forward to question this kind of nice story that inequality fell. So I, I'm not going to go into the detail on that. I'm just going to tell you that it did fall, <laughs> that we did stress test the measure by doing several things. This is what we did. First thing we did is we uh, tried to incorporate the income of the rich. You can do that for two or three, perhaps four countries in Latin America, and only partially, if you get access to tax data. Now, of course, the rich also evade taxes, so you don't get them well there, but you get better how much. So for a few countries, including Colombia, we were able to get anonymous tax, da tax data, and we merged that data and, uh, with, a, with a data on household income inequality. Tr try to see what happens when you take into account the income of the top 1%. Another thing we did is that, you know, uh, since the book of Piketty, people have been saying, well, why, why spend so much time looking at household income surveys? Why don't you just look at how much of the pie goes to labor and how much of the pie goes to capital? So look at the national accounts. And if, that, if the, the total national income, a rising proportion is going to capital, uh, and less is going to workers, that's a good enough indication that inequality may be rising. So we, we analyze the consistency or lack of consistency between what happens with the labor share of income in national accounts versus what happens with a distribution of income according to household income surveys. And then we did something that was kind of neat doing it. We, we calculated inequality in purchasing power by taking into account that different income groups face different consumption baskets. So we did all of this to try to feel more comfortable as to what, whether that, that story we're telling is actually, where, whether we're fooling ourselves or we're telling the right story. So the bottom line is that indeed inequality fell. Fell with less intensity and, and there are some nuances. First nuance is that if you look at, if you add that the rich, the level of income inequality rises. You see this is Colombia, and so this is the, the Gini coefficient calculated with the tax uh, information that captures a little bit better the income of the top. And you will see that you have about eight uh, or so, six to eight points of Gini that jumps up. So there's a lot of concentration of income at the top. There's no mystery there. But the trend, how the Gini changes over time, follows very closely to what we're measuring. So the, the story of what happened with inequality over time is hard to dismiss based on incorporation of the richer uh, people. What this is suggests is that, in fact, although there's a lot of concentration of income at the top, that was not an equalizing in the sense that the income of, the, of, the, of people below the mean uh, rose faster than the income of the very top. Although the rich are very rich, and they uh, grab a lot of the pie, they uh, did not spiral away 
from the rest of the population. The other thing we did is that we checked the consistency with these uh, national income accounts, and the message there is that if you want to look at national income accounts and look at how much of the share of income goes to labor, in fact, in Latin America, the labor share in income has been falling as has it has been falling in most of the world. In Latin America, it has fallen less than in other regions. And what you find out is that the labor share in income is a good proxy of what happens at the top but it's not a good proxy of what happens with the overall distribution of income. So the fact that the labor share of income in the national accounts has been falling means that, of course, capitalists are getting more of the pie, and that suggests that there's some concentration of income at the top, but it tells you nothing about how labor income itself is distributed, is distributed across different workers. And much of what happened in inequality in Latin America happened with labor incomes more than capital income. So it is very difficult to get a full picture of what happens with inequality if you only look at uh, uh, national accounts. It is important to study the distribution of labor income. That's the big message there. And the third one, when you look at uh, purchasing power, you look at the different consumption baskets, Clearly, you know, the rich have a very different consumption basket than the poor. The, the rich travel more, spend more in education, spend more in health, they buy better cars, etc., etc. The poor spend a lot of their money in food, and in, in the last decade, food prices went up more than the average. So that ate a little bit into their welfare. And what you find out is that if you, the inequality reduction is lower if you, if you measure it by purchasing power. You see that in the in the lighter bars, but it's still a considerable drop. So the story doesn't change. Same movie, different action, the, uh, le less intense action. So the bottom line, what I want to say is after, after doing all of this, I feel much more comfortable saying that in fact, over the past decade, inequality of income did decline in Latin America. There are nuances, there's quite a bit of concentration of income at the top, purchasing power is not well corrected, labor shares in in GDP uh, have been falling, but overall, it is, seems to be quite correct to say that income inequality uh, in, a, in a break with history came down in Latin America over the past 12 years or so. So the question is why? What drove it? So here you have the candidates of suspects, you know, you say, well, many candidate people like to think is social policy. Social policy must be part of the reason why inequality came down. And this is not a, a silly assumption. In fact, when one, when one runs a cross-country, uh, one, one, one compares cross, across countries the Gini coefficient of income inequality, what you find out is that the differences across countries is largely explained by social policy. Uh, the market income in Europe is almost as unequally distributed in Europe as the market income is distributed in Latin America. What makes the difference between Europe and Latin America on a cross-country level is essentially that in Europe there's much more redistribution policy, a stronger welfare state, and the tax and transfer system through pensions, health, etc., create this redistribution. So on a cross-country basis, the muscle, the fiscal muscle and the redistributed muscle of the state is what make, explains the differences in, in inequality. But when you look at what happens with inequality over time, it's no longer true, necessarily, that uh, social policy drives what happens with inequality. And this is exactly, so in, in Latin America you have this candidate, people love to see CCT programs, pension coverage increased, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what's true is that when you look at what happened in Latin America, social policy is an important contributor to re the reduction in poverty, but not necessarily a big contributor to the reduction in inequality. That's the uh, main message. Uh, what seems to have been the major driver of changes in inequality in Latin America over the past 12 years or so is what happened in labor markets, not what happened with social policy. Social policy helped, 
And in some countries, it was a very important contributor. On average, for Latin America, much more important what was happening with labor markets. You have this decomposition here, and you see for most countries, when you decompose the reduction in equality, you get the blue, the blue component of the, of the bar, and the blue component is labor income inequality reduction. Social policies in gray, and it matters for some countries a lot, but in general, it's not the main driver for the region as a whole. So we need to understand what happened with labor markets. And this is a good place to start. I like this. This is what I call the, the well-tuned trio. These are three lines here. The top line is, uh, sorry, this is household income inequality. This one here is labor income inequality. And the one in the middle is the returns to education. This for me is striking. These three curves moved more or less at unison Sorry, that's okay. in, in Latin America. Uh, one way to, to say this is, you know, much of what happened with, lab, with household income inequality can be attributed to what happened with labor income inequality. And what happened with labor income inequality seems to be related to what happened with returns to education. This is the main message of this graph. And this happened throughout many countries in the region. When you plot labor income inequality together with returns to education, you see that in most countries in the region, they move very closely to each other. On average, they move very closely. Also, when you look at individual countries. So if you guys want to understand what in the world happened with inequality over the last 12 years, you have to understand what happened with returns to education with labor markets. That's the main message here. So what could be that happened? So let's start by, by focusing on the, on the falling returns to education. So first of all, it is a puzzle that returns to education came down throughout Latin America. So what's the return to education? Is how much more your wage will go up for an additional year of education. And so what we normally measure is how much your wage goes up if you have tertiary education versus primary. So of course you get more, more income when you have tertiary education, but the question is do you get a lot more income relative to having primary or not? And what the data shows is that the difference between the two has been falling down. So the workers with tertiary education get higher wages, but the distance to the earnings of the primary educated workers has been shrinking. This is what has been happening. And the question is why? Why are the returns to education uh, falling? Returns to tertiary education relative to primary. So you have, uh, first, first question I have, I tell my researchers all the time is, why did it happen in many countries? There's no reason why this should happen in all countries. You would expect it to happen perhaps in Colombia, but why does it have to happen in Bolivia too, in Mexico, very different countries. Why would the returns to education be falling across the region? So first question, there seems to be some sort of a common factor at work. I have some suspicions, but it's a good point to start. Second, may, could it be that we were so good at producing educated workers that our university system really picked up and we are throwing more educated folks into the labor markets, therefore that the supply of skills, the supply of education has increased so fast that the returns to education has come down. This is what happened in the US after the second war. So that's why income inequality fell in the US because the US produced all of these educated workers through the university system, GA Bill, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is that what happened in Latin America? It's a good hypothesis. It's a wrong one, but it's a good one. <laughs> Hypothesis number two, could it be that the, the quality of education is coming down? Now, this, can, this is a good hypothesis. You can rationalize in two ways. You can say, okay, so we're, we're, we're processing more young kids through, through tertiary education, but you have two effects. The new kids that are coming to the universities are the poorer kids. So they went to lower quality primary and secondary schools, so they come less prepared. So at the margin, we are expanding the coverage, but the rich are already in the university. The new ones coming to the university are the poor, and they are less prepared. As they, as they are less prepared, when they come out of university, they are not as good professionally ready as, as others. And so the average of 
tertiary education has been coming down for this kind of mechanical effect of expanding the coverage towards the poor. That's another one possibility. The other possibility is that we got so many kids into university, and in fact we did quite a bit, that a lot of new university programs, a lot of uni uni universities were created in Latin America, and not all of them are very good. They're kind of garage universities. This is what Nora Lustig co calls perhaps a, a degradation of tertiary education. So that's a possibility. So in that case, uh, the returns to education may be falling because some problems with the quality of tertiary education. And there's a third hypothesis, which for me is the most puzzling, the most interesting, and the most difficult to test, which is maybe what's happening has to do with the demand. That is, our economies are expanded and specialized in such a way that uh, jobs that the economies are creating are not demanding education and skills as much as one would expect. So we're get, it's like as if our economies have been specializing in economic activities that do not require a lot of knowledge content, a lot of skills, and a, a lot of, of education. That could be the case where the demand for skills has been rising at a slower speed as the supply of skills. And that may be another reason why the returns to education have fallen down. Now, if this one is true, we might as well start worrying. You know, something, <laughs> something is happening with the way in which our economies are getting organized. So first, uh, first hypothesis, I think it's a dead end road because the supply of education was already increasing in the 90s and in the 80s. And in fact, it was, the supply of education was rising at a steeper slope during those years. And during those years, although the supply of education was rising very steeply, inequality and the returns to education were also rising. So it's hard to explain something that goes like this, which is the returns to education were going up, then they go down, with something that's rising <laughs> steadily throughout the two decades. The more we test it, the less it's obvious that a simple expansion of supply of education can explain the decline in the returns to education over the last 12 years. So I don't see a lot of promise in this hypothesis, but every researcher here is welcome to continue to test this one because it would be good news if this was the case. It would mean that our educational system is really finally catching up with the demands of the economy and producing a lot of educated folks, and that's what's bringing down returns to education, and that's what's making our societies more, more equal. The second one is this idea that we expanded coverage of education towards the poorer income groups, and that created problems of quality, both on the quality of the programs and universities that uh, train these new folks, but also quality in the sense that these new folks being poorer came from poorer schools and were less prepared. So in fact, when you look at this data, what you see is that the, this little bar, the last bar in all of these groups, is the, the bar that expanded the most. So the coverage expanded the most at the at 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 poorer groups. That's, this is the coverage of university education, and the expansion in coverage of university education. So take, for instance, the lower income decile. The biggest jump is in the fairly, uh, fairly, uh, fairly poor during the last decade. So it seems, in fact, that it, it is a case that in Latin America, a lot of young kids came into university for the first time. The expansion of coverage was very significant, and the expansion of coverage at the margin uh, was for the poorer income groups. So uh, in, in the research we're doing in my office, this is an interesting paper. This paper tests to see whether there was, a, there was, in fact, a decline in the quality of tertiary education that may explain this decline in returns to education. And it's trying to isolate. Is it due to the fact that the kids that are entering the university come less prepared because they are poor and they went to not, si not such good uh, uh, primary and high schools? Or is it due that we had a lot of programs, a proliferation of programs that are giving kind of bad degrees? I'm suspicious that the second one applies to many countries, including mine in Ecuador. When you walk through the streets of Ecuador, you see a lot of signs of university this and university that and master's program this and program that. It's like a huge expansion of programs that are of uh, uh, not clear uh, 
dudosa reputación, like we would say in, in, in Spanish. So uh, there may be one of the, the two one. So but this is Colombia. And in Colombia, I am not going to bore you with all of the details. In Colombia, what we find out is that it seems that the biggest effect was the first one, this one. This is the test scores of the new entrance to the university. And what you see is that the test scores have been calling down because new, the new kids that are taking those tests come uh, less prepared than the kids that were taking those tests before, as they come from poorer schools. So this seems to have driven a lot. But you see that in Colombia too, there was a huge expansion in programs and universities catering to these new entrants. And when you run the regressions, what you find out is that controlling for student characteristics and area of studies, I mean, maybe these guys are coming in and studying, I don't know, law instead of science. So when you control for areas of studies, student characteristics and the test scores at the beginning, the, the effects of the new programs weaken, which suggests that at least in Colombia, the Colombians have been able to keep a fairly high quality certification process for the uni new universities and new programs. So the new universities and new programs are probably decent, and therefore, if there's a decline in the quality of the educated student, it's not so much because the programs are not that, are not that good, but mainly because the kids are coming less prepared. That's the that's the suggestion that comes from this research. We're doing the same now for Peru and for Brazil to see how much differences happen. And there's a third one, you know, is this, is this a demand factor? Is this that we, be, we, we, we decided to specialize in commodity producing, which employs very few people, and nothing else. And so the, the sectors that are really growing in Latin America are services sectors, construction, commerce, and those are sectors that are not very demanding on engineering skills and things like that. That's the idea. And the evidence so far is quite mixed. If you run a simple scatter like this, what you see is that the skill premium or the returns to education has fallen the most in countries that have been most exposed to terms of trade expansions. Dutch disease type problems where their service sectors has expanded very fast. So maybe those, maybe to the extent that the service sectors are less demanding of skills, Maybe that's what's happening. However, the service sector is very heterogeneous. In the service sector, you have the lawyers, you have the architects, you have the financial specialists, you have, and then you have the construction workers. So it, we need to understand better the insides of the service sector. Are we, are really, our service sector has expanded very fast in Latin America. It's the fastest expanding sector. Um, the question is, it is expanding a lot acti along activities that require a lot of skills? and high productivity activities, or is it expanding along activities that require low skills, low productivity activities? That's a question mark. It's not clear. You, when you look at this data, this shows you where are the most educated workers in Latin America, and curiously enough, most of the most educated workers in Latin America are in the service sectors. So it's not very obvious that there may be an issue of demand. So what we're doing, is we're starting to look at occupations. This is the, gives you a flavor of what we're trying to do by sectors. Uh, six months from now, I'll give you the results on this, but this is what I think promises a lot. Let me explain this graph and this I will finish. This is occupations by skills. So the lower paid occupations are to the left, the higher paid occupations are to the right, and we are assuming that the lower paid occupations require less skills, the higher paid occupations require more skills. And this graph shows you which occupations expanded and which occupations contracted. Where, did, where, was, there where was there more job growth and where was there actually job contraction? So let's start with the US. This is the well-known case. Everybody talks about the US. The US has this U shape. So what's happening in the US? The occupations that are expanding are at the extremes, are the lower skilled occupations and the very high skilled occupations. In other words, which occupations are expanded? The gardeners, the plumbers, the low skilled electricians, the handymen, the handy women. <laughs> Those are expanding because they are non-routine but low skilled occupations that cannot be replaced by computers. Which occupations are contracting? The ones that are in the middle, the bank teller, the draftsman that I, uh, now can be replaced with a computer, the basic accountant, 
that can be outsourced. So those occupations are contracting. And which are occup occupations are expanding the most are to the extreme, the very high skill occupation, the ones that uh, Apple and Google need type. So this is the US. And this is the pressure that you feel in the middle that comes from outsourcing and uh, in the, in, the, in the effect of technology change. So this is the US. Now, when you look at Mexico, well, it looks like the US, but with a twist towards the, the lower paid occupation. So in Mexico, the occupations that have been expanding the most are the low skilled occupations to the left. A lot of contraction in the middle, and only at the very top you have an expansion of high skilled occupations. So this is Mexico. Brazil looks like the U.S. on asteroids, right? Because you have a similar pattern. Uh, expansion in the lower end, expansion in the higher end, and rather a lot of contraction and occupations in the middle. Chile is the only country that looks more like a skill bias technical change story. In Chile, most of the occupations to the left are contracting, including the lowest skilled occupations and the growth is in the high skill occupation. So Chile gets you, the impression you get from this graph is that Chile's economy is specializing in knowledge or in high skills in a kind of an ambiguous way. It doesn't have this U shape that you see in other. So what would you need to do? You would need to do this by sectors, construction and services, non-tradables, tradables, to see to what extent demand patterns, job creation, the way in which our economies are specializing are part of the story of the inequality reduction. So, uh, to finish, the fall in the skill premium, the fall in returns to education is a key part of the story of why inequality came down in Latin America. We still do not understand exactly why it fell, but we need to understand that. We know that in other parts of the labor market, other gaps were being reduced, you know. Hugo Nyopo is around here and he has documented some of this, that the gaps between the wages of women and men have been coming down, the gaps between rural, urban wages have been coming down, the gap between uh, ethnic groups and the uh, majority of the population, the wage gaps have been falling down. So many more things have been happening in labor markets in addition to the falling returns to, to, to skills. So you have a complex story to, to tell there. For a given skill premium, the changes in the composition of the labor force may have affected income inequality also in many, many ways. The aging of the, of the, of the educated workers, whether it's a marriage penalty for women who have become mothers and also professionals, and et cetera, et cetera. And we still need to understand some institutional changes such as uh, what happened with minimum wage, which had an important bearing, for instance, in Brazil. My point is that understanding what happened in the labor markets is the key to the secret of understanding what happened with income inequality in Latin America. And the uh, research that needs to be done to understand what hap happened in labor markets is gigantic. However, one thing is true. Part of the story seems to be related to how our economies are specializing, what activities, what sectors, what business lines are being developed in the economies. For a Latin America that's now at a low growth path, one would expect that growth will pick up based on the use of knowledge, human capital, skills, education. So if we succeed in our growth agenda, we may actually, in the transition, create a, an increase in income inequality. Because if our growth agenda pays off, we should see a lot of demand for highly educated workers and Educational systems normally have a lag, have a, uh, have a hard time keeping up with the demand. So you have a, you're going to have an interesting tension in Latin America. To the extent that we succeed in a vigorous growth agenda, we may actually he see some reversal in the declining inequality. So Latin America is going to be torn in trying to put together this growth with equity uh, package. In the last decade, we were lucky. We could put growth with equity because the world helped us. And, but it, it may have created some weaknesses 
in the way in which our economies are organized. And so to some extent, the good news of inequality reduction in Latin America may hide a little bit of a dark side that the decline in inequality in Latin America may be reflecting the fact that our economies are not specialized in the way we would like them to specialize from the point of view of growth. So, there you go. I was to thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, I'd just like to briefly thank Christine Zeno, who's coming up to the front, as well as Alejandra Argueta there in the back, um, for their uh, really heroic uh, efforts in helping today put together today's seminar. Um, Veronica Colon, our associate, um, has uh, been away on family medical health emergency leave, um, and so uh, we had a last, la lot of last minute thanks. We also would like to thank our colleagues at the World Bank who assisted with the organization. Um, Anken. Well, first, first of all, um, good morning to everybody, and, and really thank you very much for the, for the very kind invitation to, to be here and, and catch up with, with so many friends that I see in, in the public, and also a, a privilege to be here with, with, with Augusto and, and Cynthia talking about, about inequality. What I will do in, in 10, 15 minutes is basically share with you um, some of the analysis that we have done at the OECD Development Center on, on, on inequality, an issue that is more pressing today when we are seeing a region that is slowing down and that, to put it just for, as an illustration, in 2014 grew less than the OECD average for the first time in 10 years. So something is happening and unfortunately all the figures for 2015 suggest that this is going to happen again. So uh, it's a region which is not converging. It's a region that will have less resources, so uh, addressing inequality will, will require uh, wiser policies because, as, as Augusto, was, what Augusto was mentioning, well, less resources will be available to, to counteract all these, all these um, pressures. So I will, I will uh, complement one, um, basically the points of, of, of the previous presentation by adding, let's say, a static view, but comparing with the OECD average. You have seen all the evolution, the dynamics of inequality in, in, in Latin America, but maybe it's, 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 it's important to, to ask us, why is it so high? I mean, inequality has been decreasing, but from very, very high levels when we compare it with other regions uh, and with developed economies. Why is it? Is it uh, in, a, in the DNA of Latin Americans that make the region more unequal or is it a matter of policies? And that, that's, that's, that's the first, first question I will address. Secondly, uh, since we need wiser policies in this downturn, uh, slowdown environment, we, we have to choose well what to, where to attack. And, and here, based on our recent flag, flagship publication, we will see and we will um, ask us whether education is really working. I mean, is it working to equalize incomes and give opportunities or actually is reproducing the inequalities we see at the, at the household before going to school? And, and finally, my last point would be on, on the political economy of every, everything of this. I mean, we, if we need uh, solid, bolder policies, we need to, to build support. Can we rely on this emerging middle class? Can we rely on this, on this population that, that, that escaped poverty in the last few years to, to support and to finance some of these policies or, or, or not? Basically, these are the, the, the three factors. So, to begin with, uh, According to our analysis, uh, we very much share uh, that for certain Latin American countries, for instance here Chile and Mexico, what we see is that inequality, income, income inequality has, has been decreasing uh, from, from very high levels. Uh, our, our figures, for instance, uh, suggest that, that the ratios of, of income for, for the top 10% versus the bottom 10% also have, have decreased. Uh, but, but what strikes me more from this figure is how high is inequality to begin with when we compare it with, with other economies such as the US or even the OECD average. So why is it so high? Uh, in, in, in Chile or in Mexico, the top 10% earn nearly 10, uh, 30 times what, what the bottom 10% earns. Uh, this, this is compared with 15 times in the US or 10 times in the OECD. So we are talking about a huge uh, inequality. But as, as Augusto mentioned, when we uh, analyze inequality before uh, the families and the, and, and, and the citizens pay taxes, receive 
cash transfers or receive public services, where basically you, don't, you cannot distinguish where is the OECD and where is Latin America. The OECD is the last point. This is the average. And this is a sample of Latin American countries. So actually, inequality before the action of the state is not different. There's nothing in, in, the, in the DNA, I was, I was, as I was provoking a little bit, in Latin America that makes re the region more unequal than, than, than others. It's the action of the state. After we, we pay taxes, this is, this is the inequality we see in most Latin American countries, and this, the, this is the inequality we see in OECD countries. So basically, inequality is halved after you pay, pay direct taxes, after you get cash transfers, and after you get health and services in, in OECD countries. And it happens much more weaker in, 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 in Latin America, so it's, it's a matter of policies. An analysis we did uh, for Chile and Mexico some years ago to identify where the difference comes from, well, I would say first is the difference of monetary transfers. They tend, tend to be less powerful and less progressive in Latin America than at the OECD. And also the direct taxes, which are lower and less progressive again. So actually it's a matter of policies. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a course, it's not something that we have to live in. It's just a decision uh, to, to, to distribute the resources as, as they are. No? Uh, and I would say that for many Latin American countries, it's a matter of the size of the public state. When, when we compare the, the, the size of the government in many Latin American countries and in OECD, where we are comparing 20% of GDP in Latin America, almost 35% in OECD. But for, for, for many others, or for some others uh, in, in the southern corner, it's also a matter of allocation. Argentina, Brazil, or Uruguay have uh, public sectors that are comparable to those of the OECD countries, of developed economies, but actually they redistribute much less. So what we are seeing here is, is, is a weaker state, a weaker action of the government to, to equalize um, uh, income and, and <coughs> probably wealth. So um, should I have to pick one policy in this uh, slowdown to, to address uh, inequality, I would pick education because it would matter for, for equity, but also for growth. So, uh, but, but it's important to, to ask, uh, ask us ourselves um, if education is actually working uh, as, a, as this social elevator to, to equalize income, or, is, or, or it isn't, to, to, to see where we are. And uh, according to our analysis of our last, last flagship publication that we will be presenting in Washington in, in a couple of months' uh, time, but what we see is the first, on average, the education in Latin America has lower quality than in OECD countries. Uh, on average, in Latin America, students go 11 years to school, more or less. And, and in, uh, in OECD countries, um, it's something like 15, 17, uh, 15, 16 years time. However, when we evaluate the students through PISA, this exam that the OECD has, uh, and we evaluate the, uh, their performance, it's as if the student had gone two years less to school, because I mean, the, the quality of these, 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 these schools in, in, in Latin American countries is lower. So first, we have to pick education, but education it has a low quality. So the strength that it has is, is a little bit lower to address uh, the, the growth and, and the equity I was mentioning. And the second factor, the second challenging factor we see in education is how unequal it is. Uh, more, more than one third of the results of the students are explained by their household. Where do they come from? If you're a rich student, 30% of your, of, of your result is gonna be good because you have books and good condition at home. If you are poor, one third of it is, al is already there. So it's something happening there that is, it explains a lot of the, of the performance of, of the students. So what we did in the flagship, and, and our, our media colleagues at the OECD always tell me not to put any, 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 any regression. I mean, Augusto did it, so if Augusto can do it, I will, I will tell them to do it the next time, because they convinced me to do infographics. So I'm not into this, but I will do, use them because I mean, we, we devote a lot of time. So based on infographics, our analysis, which is based on some working papers I can, I can share, first, inequality to access of access to secondary education is still very high. If you are in the, in the top 20%, uh, you will go to secondary education. If you are in the bottom 20%, only six out of 10 go to secondary education. So first, unequal access. 
But even those who access, remember the 30% of the results based on the household, you, have, you see many differences. If you are in the top 20%, top you, and you go the same years to school as those who are, who are at the bottom 25%, is as if you have gone two more years than they, they have done. Because they, the performance you do is better because the, your, your socioeconomic background is better. So actually, it seems that education so far is reproducing the inequalities we see in the family level. Other, other angles of, of, of inequality are important. Here we have focused a lot on, on income inequality, uh, but also obviously um, gender inequality, private versus versus public schools or even rural versus urban schools, we see uh, some differences. But on overall, the message of, on education is a reproduction of, of the inequalities we see. Just to, and, and by the way, this is a matter of policies again. When we see the quality uh, of the resources that, that the schools have, and we, we compare them with the, with the type of students that attend, attend at the school, we can see actually that the schools attended by rich students tend to have more quality resources than those attended by poor students. And this is happening more in Latin America than in OECD countries, with the exception of Uruguay. So actually, we are giving quality resources to schools uh, attended by students who already have come with from, from very good or better backgrounds. And the last part of on, on this education part, it's, it's, um, it's basically to, to, to illustrate how unequal and how, how inequality is reproduced here is the per capita income of different neighbors in, in Santiago, uh, Santiago de Chile, if you go um, from west to, to east. Basically, if you go from west to east, in the, me in the line one of the metro, your, your per capita income can be multiplied by five. This is, this is the inequality we see within a city. What happens with the uh, education uh, performance, the education results of students in each of these neighborhoods, where actually they reproduce exactly the same pattern that we <coughs> see in, in income. So actually the results we see in, in schools are actually the, the, the reproduce the inequality we see at the, at the household. So if I had to say, if I, I have to answer the, the, the question, is a social elevator working? Well, it is not. It could, but it is not so far because today, basically, it's not an elevator. You just get there and it reproduces and, and, and you get out and it's the same floor. If you are in the lower floor, you get into the elevator and you will keep to in, the, in the lower floor and you are in the upper floor, you will stay there. At least it's not, it's not moving down. The elevator is not coming down, but the social elevator would, would work in the, in the sense that you get into, into some level of income and you end up having Lower, a higher level of education and income that, that your parents, which is not wha what we are seeing. So to, 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 to end, uh, um, we need analysis, but also we need action. Uh, and many of these policies actually will, will demand some political will and political support. So uh, as, as our friends from, from the World Bank showed to us some, some years ago, one of the good uh, news in Latin America in the last years have been the decrease in poverty rates. And uh, today, ECLAC was, was publishing the last uh, poverty figures. Poverty has uh, peaked a little bit in 2013, but still we are talking about uh, poverty rates which are much lower than the ones we had in the mid-90s or in the mid-2000s. That means that we have, a, we have a majority of population who are not poor. They are in this, uh, we, we call it at the OECD, the middle sectors. Because within the middle sectors, you have the middle class and you have something else which are vulnerable populations. So can we rely on this majority of population to actually support and finance these education policies? Well, actually, the support from democracy from these middle sectors is among the highest when we, con we see it in, in just income levels that, 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 that others, either the poor or the affluent. And in terms of ideology, these middle sectors tend to be moderate. So actually, if we are thinking about state policies to, to foster education for all and to, and to uh, assure the, the, quali the quality of opportunities, these are good news. Which are the bad news? Well, first of all, is that the, the, their relation with the state or, the, or, or with the government of these middle sectors, either vulnerable or middle class, are really fragile. Uh, just to, 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 to pick the, the vulnerable, that is those who are not poor, have and have uh, between four and ten dollars a day, 
Well, in this case, in Mexico today, six out of ten households in this, in this, in this socioeconomic um, group do, do have no uh, formal job in the household. So no one in the household holds a formal job in six out of ten households in Mexico. Uh, and these are not the poor. These are this second socioeconomic group. This level of informality is 70% in the case of Colombia or 80% 80, 80 in the case of Peru. So if we want to base some policy action in this socioeconomic group, well, the challenge is that the relation with the state is really fragile. Actually, they, they, they try not to pay taxes or not contribute to any social insurance, social protection scheme. And also, uh, they are un, as unsatisfied with the public services as the poor. So uh, the challenge is to convince this new socioeconomic group actually to contribute or to finance and to support policies uh, with a history of unsatisfaction. Because when we asked, when people asked whether they are satisfied with, with healthcare, with education, or even with labor, labor policies, well, these groups tend to not be satisfied at all. So why to pay for something that, that you don't value right, at all? So let me conclude. I, I tend to be optimistic, uh, and I, I, I always look at the bright side of, of, of the things. Uh, and in this gray uh, Washington that is very gray, it's as gray as Paris, I, I'll, I'll try to, to be a little bit uh, cheerful and, and to, to say that first, the things can change. I mean, policies can be fixed. As you have seen, uh, the high levels of inequality of Latin America versus the OECD are a matter of policies. Before the action of the state, inequality is comparable among the two, the two regions. Uh, education seems to be one of the wiser policies to invest in. And in this case, I would say education, primary, secondary education, but also education for work, because the systems uh, to, to address, I mean, the, the skills that our workers have in the region today are not, are not working. And today we have more than 130 million workers working in informality. So education, broadly uh, understood, is one of the, of the key issues because it could address both equity and growth in an in a, in a environment of, of slowdown. And finally, yeah, I think we can, we can count of on the middle class, but with an absolutely different social contract because today when we see the, the figures of the tax benefits of, of this middle class, another project we are doing right now, I mean, we see that the middle class in Latin America don't pay taxes and don't get, don't get any public services or because they don't value them at all. So we can rely, rely on them um, uh, as far as we convince them that we are going to be offering high quality services. Thank you very much. I'm very much willing to the conversation. Uh, thank you, Angel. We have time for questions. Um, we'd ask that you identify yourself, please, and also wait for a microphone so that people who are watching this uh, via the web or uh, subsequently um, by video on our website will know who you are and can hear you. Um, comments, questions. Um, I see, let's take two or three comments. I see somebody way in the back and then I see a hand over here and a hand up front. So let's take those three initially. Yes, uh, thank you. Ruben Barrera with the Mexican News Agency, Notimex. And this is a question for Augusto. Um, uh, the, the question basically, Augusto, is uh, you said, well, you and, and, and the other expositor, uh, you say that inequality in Latin America has been uh, going down in the last couple of years. But I think that I, I didn't find the next part of that phrase uh, because in some way you uh, left the sensation that inequality has been down, but, so I don't know if that is that but, and you can explain it to, just to complement the idea, I mean, uh, uh, what part is, is missing? I mean, if the equality is reducing, what is the other factor that keeps you guys looking at this, at this phenomenon? Okay, and there was someone over here on the side. Um, maybe, yeah. Hi, Carlos Santizio from the IDB. Uh, one question for, for Augusto, um, I mean, Inequality, yes, is, is, is decreasing, but from high levels. Predicting the future, is it inequality going to increase in a lower growth environment? I mean, is there like a steady state of inequality in Latin America at the end of the day, if you look into a long-term 
perspective that may may make us a little bit uh, pessimistic, I'm afraid. <laughs> and the, the second question was for Angel, is, is really, this, there's a whole debate about lack of social mobility in Latin America that, you know, it's the movement across, um, uh, across uh, classes. How dynamic is Latin America of, you know, of that the, it's not like the, uh, the poor people all moving up into the middle income, but across sectors, I mean, across classes, how dynamic is Latin America compared to other regions, maybe middle income regions? Okay, and then we'll take one more from up here. Alejandra, um, Hi, my question is for uh, Mr. Melguizo. Um, I'm wondering, is it possible that it is the problem is not in the quality of education, but rather on the access to high quality jobs? Okay, can you identify yourself? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Mary, I'm from the Canadian Embassy. Thank you. Okay, uh, who wants to start? Augusto. Okay, um, you know, I, I have the feeling that uh, the fact that inequality of income came down in Latin America over the past 12 years or 15 years is good news. Don't take me wrong, I think it's good news. The question is whether behind the drivers, the drivers that were behind the falling inequality are telling us some warning signals with respect to broader development objectives in Latin America or, or are pointing, as Angel was saying, to areas where we need to strengthen policies. And so the fact that, there, that when you analyze what is behind inequality, you come up with the idea that something needs to be done doesn't mean that it was not good, good news. I think for a region that's so unequal, to have a decline in income inequality is great news. We do not know whether wealth inequality fell as much as income inequality. That's a different issue. We don't have data to, to say anything about that. But So my sense is that it's good news overall, but we need to understand why it came down so that we have a sensible discussion as to what we need to do in the future to continue to st strive and try to achieve this magical combination of uh, growth with equity uh, and the challenge for Latin America is we will 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 we be able to put that formula together in the years going forward getting higher growth and at the same time continue to make progress on the social equity side and so that's that brings me to the second question it's what will happen in the future well I wish I would know I really I really hope I would know but I would I would give three three possible answers on this in the short run, in the short run, the most important factor on, uh, that affects inequality is employment. So when you run a regression and you control for human capital, uh, skills, a bunch of other things, and you see what really can affect inequality in the next year, two years, or months, it's what happens with, uh, with employment. And the story in Latin America is, uh, is a bit uh, of a paradox because for all of the declining growth of the last since 2012 until the present the last two three years growth has been really tanking employment remains high and so the, the, the declining growth has not had a significant impact on social structure so far and and politicians know this very well because politicians uh, do not really worry too much about growth. They worry about employment. And when they are thinking, you know, what I need to do, it's, it's keeping employment up. And, and, and this is a key question for Latin America. Under this growth slowdown, there will be need to adjust aggregate demand, to do some expenditure switching policies. You may need to tighten your fiscal. Uh, will that have an effect on employment? It will depend how this is managed. But this, I, I think we have to keep this, this an eye on. The second thing uh, about inequality is exactly what Angel was saying. If we really want to have a permanent uh, effect and create a, a much more fair region where people feel that they are not mistreated, we are going to need to have a big uh, effort in our social policy. We're gonna need to raise more taxes, 
spend them better, make sure that our uh, big social safety nets like pensions, health, our education system are more equalizing, and we are far from that. Angel has shown very clearly that our education system is far from, from exerting the equalizing effect that we expect from education systems. If you really want an education system that does the trick, look at South Korea's. In South Korea, it doesn't matter whether you were born in a poor family or a rich family, you get sent through the same high quality educational system and you're given a chance and your future depends very little on when you were born. In Latin America, there's too high a correlation between where you were born and where you end up. Because we don't have these huge equalizing mechanisms of a high quality, high access educational system. So uh, that's a thing to, to look. And the third thing to look, which I think is really important, and it's normally downplayed by, uh, by social scientists, is that what happens with inequality will depend dramatically on what type of jobs we create in the future. So we could go for a, an economy that creates a lot of low-skilled jobs, and maybe we will get a more equal society, but very lousy growth. So you could have trade-offs depending on your growth patterns, where you can employ a lot of the low skilled and incomes can become more equal, and yet the economy will become less robust. And then on the other hand, you can have a, a significant uh, modernization of the economy. You work on infrastructure, you work on education, you work on the universities, you work on your trade, and all of a sudden you have economies that are picking up technological change and they demand high-skilled workers, it may be that for a while we get a, a higher inequality in the transition until we can catch up with our systems to produce skills. So nothing is simple. <laughs> and what will happen in the future will depend on the short term, uh, dynamics with employment, on what happens with social policy and how effective it is, which depends on how much taxes we can raise and how well we can spend them. And it will depend crucially on what happens with our growth agenda. Okay. Yeah, I'll, um, very much in line my, my, my comments on, on social mobility. Um, well, actually, the, the data would, would show that at least in the last decade is a, is a big social mobility. I mean, the movement, our, our, the, the, the flagship that our colleagues at the World Bank did on, on middle classes show a, a, a big mobility from the poor to the vulnerable, but also from the vulnerable to the middle class. So the data is there, and clearly uh, the, the mobility has been high. But probably the but that the, our Mexican friend was, was asking is how sustainable was that? Uh, and here I, I think we, we agree that the sustainability is the key is the key doubt we have, because in terms of education, this this mobility is not in the figures. Uh, when we when we did some analysis on middle classes some years ago, we saw that in Latin America you basically have uh, the, the education of your parents. That's all. You reproduce the education of your parents, while in the in the rest of the world, what you see is basically you you surpass them a little bit. Uh, if they are secondary, you are tertiary. If they are tertiary, you are a little bit more. So in terms of sustainability, this, 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 uh, this, uh, um, this education doesn't point to, to, to very, very good results. And neither in terms of jobs. So I, I, I very much support the, the focus of, of Augusto, education and jobs. When we see informality, we don't see a movement from formality to informality of those, of those groups on a stable way. On the, on the contrary, we, we see movement every year from formality to informality, from activity to self-employment. So uh, overall, I would say that social mobility is, is, is not sustainable, I mean, not sustainably high. It has been high, but, but the foundations need to be rebuilt. And on, on, on jobs, probably, uh, if I understood correctly, your question is, Samari, if, if there is a demand for, for, for jobs, so, so we, 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 we help people to get educated, but maybe the jobs are not there. So uh, why, why, why is it this case? Well, actually, we try to test the, the, this hypothesis of a region specializing in commodities and say, like, and maybe if in a region that just exports commodities, well, you don't need skills anymore because actually to export them, you need basic skills. Well, uh, the World Bank has an, an enterprise survey, and we did uh, research uh, by sectors. Where are the, the biggest skill gaps? And in Latin America, we, we identify machinery and the auto industry as, as, the, as the industries where most firms say, 
I, I have projects, but I don't need the skills. I don't find the skills I need. So probably the demand is there, but the, the supply of skills probably is not the supply of secondary education, but the supply of, of technical skills is what is lacking. So, so I couldn't put too much, uh, too much, pre, um, too much weight on the on the demand hypothesis, and more on the on the supply side. But, but this is a, qu a key question who, who takes us directly again to education and jobs. We have another round. Wow, lots of hands. Let's start here, here, and uh, Barbara, and we'll come back to you for the next round. Well, thank you. My name is Jose Carrera from CAF, Development Bank of Latin America. Well, first of all, congratulations to Augusto and Angel for their presentations. I have some reflections to contribute. One is that uh, even though inequality is very important, I think that we should take into account that in terms of policy formulation, social inclusion is, uh, I think, uh, very, very important to take into account. Because let me show you with one example what we have found. We have done a, a study for uh, 280 cities in Latin America. Uh, what, was, what has been the, the trend in inequality, income inequality? And we have found, perhaps in all Latin America from 1990 to 2002, the inequality in, in, in all of Latin America increases, and from 2002 to 2010, it, it decreases the inequality. When you analyze in terms of countries, you do Colombia, and the pattern is quite the same. But when do you analyze Medellin in Colombia, which is a city that is uh, well known for their policies, social inclusion policies, the, the pattern is different. That is, from 1990 to 2002, the inequality increases, and from 2002 to 2010, the inequality continues to increase, despite of the efforts of the city for uh, including, really including in terms of transport, urban transport, and it's well known the efforts they have done, the inclusion in terms of health, in education, and so, what is important, I, I guess, is not only work on the side of inequality, but more importantly, I think, try to figure out what policies uh, improve social inclusion in terms of education, health, water quality of, uh, for all, education for quality of for all, and, and so forth. So I think this is a, um, one idea I, I would like to left. Sure. Just pass, pass it right back here. Thank you, Augusto and I, I, Angel. No, the guy behind you. I'll get you in the next round, okay? Right, right behind you. Sorry, 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 Perdón. <laughs> Th thank you very much. Um, Bob Kaplan from the Inter-American Foundation. And I actually uh, had a point that is very similar to the, the preceding speaker uh, related to social inclusion. I'd like to thank you very much for your very thoughtful f comments, but I wonder if you could um, speak a little bit about persistent poverty among traditionally excluded groups. You didn't mention uh, the fact that of the, the gains uh, over the last decade, few decades, uh, they've really come up short with uh, indigenous populations, with African descendant populations, persons with disabilities, groups that still um, suffer from poverty, 50 to 60 percent of, uh, of, of the people in, the, in those categories, with the populations in those categories actually increasing. Uh, Poverty, the numbers of poverty, numbers of poor, are actually increasing in those groups, not, decl not declining, uh, quite contrary to what's happening in, in, in other groups. So I wonder if you could uh, talk about social mobility and the particular challenges of reaching um, and, and bringing up uh, groups that, that are traditionally excluded um, in, in, in Latin America, in the countries that you're looking at. Thank you. Barbara? Thank you, Barbara Stallings Brown University. Um, Augusto, I want to push you a bit on some methodological issues and what seemed to me to be two different pieces of your presentation which you didn't bring together and I hope to push you to bring them together. And this has to do with what happens with the very top of the distribution compared to um, the middle deciles um, which you rightly identify with labor. Um, it's certainly the case, and I would refer back to Sam Morley, who's in the back of the room. We did some work together at income distribution in Latin America at ECLAC a number of years ago, um, that it's very difficult to get at the top group. They are generally, as you said, not included in the household survey genies, 
they may or may not be included in the capital labor ratio. But even the top decile in the household genie ends up, or at least was, extremely important in determining um, the overall income distribution. There was a, a study by the IDB, um, it must now have been maybe 15 years ago, um, which was very dramatic, that if you cut off the top decile in the Latin American income distribution, the bottom 90% was more or less the same as Europe or even East Asia. So that it was that top decile within the household distribution. Um, so that's, on the one hand, indicates that we really need to pay more attention um, to how to measure this and to analyze this. But then, Augusto, you went on to say, after having mentioned this, you went on to say that the really important part in terms of distribution nowadays is to distribution within the labor sector of the economy. So it seems to me that there is sort of a, a disconnect between these, these two parts. And I hope that you can say a bit more about um, why you then left the, the richest part and went down to what's going on within labor. Very, very minor points because I think you, they were mostly for, for, for Augusto. Just on the, on, the, on the persistent poverty part and using also advertising our report on education, okay? No, just, just, just joking. Um, we, um, we did um, an analysis also of rural versus, versus uh, urban schools in Latin America, secondary, secondary education. Uh, if you if you s see them, I mean, rural rural um, schools students perform worse than that in, in urban ones. But after you control for for everything that you should control for in terms of socioeconomic education, the type of family and the type of school, actually they are as effective as urban. So there is nothing in the rural schools that makes them worse than in the urban. So if you want my comment on that, uh, not being an expert on poverty, I would say more investment in rural schools in Latin America may work a lot uh, in order to, to move people outside poverty because actually, and, and they, are, they, are, they are effective, actually, uh, at least they are, they are effective in terms of, of we are, what, what we are seeing so far. So on the, on the question of persistence of poverty pockets, no, that's a hugely important uh, theme um, because persistence is very difficult to study. It's very important and yet very difficult to study because to study persistence you need to have, you need to track the same people over time. And the data we have uh, doesn't have that panel structure. In the, in, and so the world, some, some of the World Bank colleagues have developed these interesting techniques that they call pseudo, pseudo panels. So uh, where, where you, by looking at some observable characteristics, you can cr create kind of a, a, almost like a panel to try to understand why is it that some groups are stuck in chronic poverty. So uh, my best answer to that is that in about two months, we will have a study, a brand new study that talks about chronic poverty where we finally were able to say something about what are the mechanisms through which poverty gets reproduced and, and have this locking effect. Um, the fact that we have these poverty pockets should not, however, diminish the importance of this huge story in Latin America that uh, 80 million people have come out of poverty. I mean, this is remarkable. It, that doesn't mean that we should forget about the chronic poverty, but I'm just saying we, we need uh, uh, a new balance. For me, the, the, changing, it does, the changing social structure is very important, and it's putting a lot of stress and tension on our social policies because they need to be adapted. I think uh, our very successful conditional cash transfers have helped. We need to continue to target them better, but in a sense, we need a social policy that goes beyond conditional cash transfers and these second generation social policies are gonna be very tricky and very difficult politically for Latin America because they involve bigger systemic issues, you know, like education, health, pensions, unemployment, insurance, etc. So not to, uh, I mean, uh, this issue of chronic poverty, hugely important, and I hope you'll be around when we come out with our, our report on that. 
which of course creates all of these linkages to indigenous groups and to, and to minorities. Uh, okay, so that's on that. And then Barbara, well, your, your questions are always very difficult, you see. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right that one still is left wanting when one looks at the data because it is so difficult to really capture income dynamics at the top, so difficult. Uh, so clearly one has the limitation of the household surveys because they are not capturing capital income, they are not capturing, capturing the top 1%, but what you're saying is that even if you look at the household surveys, you, you could tell something. Yes, but what we can tell over the last 12 years is rather different than what we were used to in Latin America, say in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s. Uh, what we see is that uh, there was a lot of pro -poor, poor growth in the last 15 years. When you look at the income of the lowest decile, it was the one that grew the fastest compared to the income of the upper deciles. And it happened all across the region with the exception of Guatemala, maybe Honduras. I have a graph that I didn't show, I, but I have it, I can send you, which is, I think, remarkable how much pro poor growth happened. Now, of course, the levels are very different. Those are at the top this I'll get a lot of the a lot of the pie. But when you look at the rates of change of the incomes of the people at the top and the, the incomes of the people at the bottom, last fifteen years were remarkable in terms of pro poor growth. Even not capturing capital income in the top one percent by just looking at that. Uh, so uh, I think it's hard to de to deny that we have had a, an incredibly pro pro poor decade. Uh, but one should be careful on, on, on saying it too loud because we really do not know what happened at the very, very top. Yes, I, I, I think that's, that's precisely the conclusion. I don't know the actual size of these differences, but that differences should be identifiable for the sim from the simple analysis of income dynamics at, at different deciles. Okay, we do have time for more, so we'll go here, we'll go to this gentleman, and then, <laughs> wow, jeez. Uh, <laughs> there was somebody a little bit further in the back. Um, yes, this, this guy who's leaning towards the aisle. Um, and then we'll come back here to the white jacket and back, and that'll be our final. <laughs> Final, uh, final round, okay. Uh, yeah, we're gonna start, yes, we start right up here, sorry. Um, Heidi Smith with George Mason University. I was trying to operationalize some of the, the hypotheses that you were presenting, and I was thinking about, this is for both Angel and Augusto, and I was thinking of specific policies, recommendations that you would provide. Sabius Previs, perfect environment, you've got a great Congress, prove anything you want in any country. Um, what would be four top policies um, ch tinkering with income taxes, setting up minimum wage, improving the minimum wage, um, improving college loan program or um, certification programs for college tertiary education, or um, setting up a take a play, take, take a page off of the U.S. playbook, free community colleges. Um, uh, which would you choose in the perfect policy environment? And and also, um, Ankil started to talk a little bit about informality versus formality of the, of the labor sector. And if you were choosing, sounded to me like the free community colleges was the key, but what do you do with so many informal workers in your analysis? And then across the aisle here. Yes. Thank you, Augusto and, and Angel, for the great uh, illuminating presentation. Uh, Abel Mejia from CAF, Latin American Development Bank. Uh, as we were talking, it's, uh, I remember the State of the Union of last week, it's, uh, where it was centered on inequality and they made a very key policy proposal. One was on preschooling and the other one was on community college. My, my question to you is, if there is any evidence, analytical evidence that shows the return to the investment in access to preschooling, huh? I have to confess that I'm extremely impressed by my grandchildren when they come out of the, the you know, the, the, the preschooling, you know, it's, uh, they, they go. The, the, the quality of the argues, the argumentation, the, the use of the language, the socialization, the, the preparedness to go into primary school. Is any evidence that shows that 
And the second is on the tertiary education is insisting on, on the community college, which is uh, the employability of the people coming out of the community college, more flexible, is uh, less cost, but, uh, and how that compares to college education, to masters and PhD, is any segmentation there that shows the returns to investment in each one of these segments, which at the end of the day, the market, as you said, in Latin America, is, is responding to that with all of these academies, piratas in, in, in every street. You know, it's, it's responding to the demand that the market is presenting to them. Thank you. Uh, there was, yes, this gentleman all the way in the back. Uh, Sam Morley from IFPRI. Ah. Um, uh, thank you, Barbara, for the, the advertisement. Uh, but I wanted to push Augusto just a, a little <laughs> bit. I think your, your, your presentation is tremendously uh, interesting and informative. But I would like to push you to think a little bit harder about the rural versus urban uh, part of the story. We've been doing quite a bit of work at IFPRI uh, showing uh, reductions in rural poverty and they re and, and Latin American, Latin American uh, countries, particularly Brazil, your country, Ecuador, uh, Chile, and other countries have been very successful in reducing rural poverty in a period of rapid growth. And it appears that the rapid growth allowed for a lot of rural to urban migration so that the people that you see at the bottom in some of your countries there, like Brazil uh, and like Chile, uh, are, are being drawn to the cities where they're occupying the lowest, uh, the lowest occupations. So, but their level of income, the level of income and the level of wages that they get in the cities is much higher than, the, than they had in the countryside, which would ex help explain a reduction in rural poverty that coupled with rapid growth. It's not obvious what's gonna happen in the future. Thank you. Okay, this uh, person here in the white jacket. Hi, my name is Claire from DevX. We spoke last week. <laughs> But thank you. Um, my question is because DevX is an audience mainly for implementers in the development field. I'm coming from um, more of a development aspect. Wondering practically um, any new places of increased focus where implementers can step in, um, any moves that are actually being done at places like the IDB, World Bank, um, to make changes in these areas for more social equity. Um, Augusto, you said taxes are forthcoming. I don't know what those are being put to um, specifically, but just any new places where implementers can be watching out for. A slightly different way, I think, of phrasing that question is, are there any um, concrete examples of improvement in educational quality, for example? Um, you pointed out, and the OECD has point, pointed out um, a lot about the, the way inequality falls as after after taxes and transfers um, in Latin America versus OECD countries, but a key part of tax reform is improving the quality of spending. So I guess that's a, another way of phrasing your question. And we had, I think, one other person on this side, but if not, we'll, uh, uh, sure, right here, and then we'll close it. Hi, Juan Misle, Latin American Working Group. This is a pretty broad question for both of you. So what will be the long-term effect on income inequality for countries that overly relied on high commodity prices and you know, countries that did not diversify their economies. And speaking specifically here about Argentina and Venezuela, now that they're forced um, to honor their debt payments to their financial lenders. So what would be the um, overall impact of that on income inequality? Thank you. Great. Um, Angel, do you want to go first? Very tough questions. I, I think I learned a lot. Yeah today and one of the things I learned from Augusto is to say that there is a report coming so <laughs> uh, there's a report coming uh, and, and, and then nobody <laughs> and no uh, very no seriously very very good questions and I will try to answer a little bit of them um, first on the having a good Congress means that we can raise taxes or not can we have more money to to do the the policies or no Oh, well, I mean, that, that, that is things. Yeah, no, but um, I mean, and this is, I mean, why my question is, this is one key issue. I mean, can most of, of Latin American countries actually raise a little bit of their taxes or not to finance most of their policies? That's one of the key constraints I would, I would say that we need to, to address uh, those, those, those issues. Taxes, probably, I mean, a more progressive direct taxation, I think, is, is needed to, to capture probably not just this 
uh, top 10 percent but also a little bit more because when when we have this personal income tax here in, in latin america versus uh, obviously the countries we are talking about the 10 to the 20 top percent of the population paying that tax you move to Europe, it's the 80% of the population contributing on a progressive way. So given that we have resources, uh, I will invest more, more in pre-primary education, and that's related to one of the results. When, what we, when we see uh, from results of PISA, the students who, who, who attended pre-primary education do better than those who didn't, uh, equally controlling for everything else. So, so actually we, we see a, a better performance uh, in, the, in the secondary education having attended this, this pre-primary one. So, uh, and in pre-primary education, expenditure is low in Latin America versus the other. I mean, overall, uh, Latin America expends nearly 5% of GDP in education, OECD countries 5.5, so we are close, but we are younger. So in per capita income, students, uh, student terms is, is lower, and in pre-primary is, is lower. And uh, a second policy is the quality of teachers. Uh, again, based on PISA, we see no effect of having a certified, officially certified teacher, that mm, a teacher without any certification in Latin America. It doesn't matter for the student performance, and it does in OECD countries. So clearly the certification we have in the region so sh shows Something else, but not really the impact in, in performance. So investing in this certification would be another practical issue. And thirdly, uh, I've, I've mentioned it, education for work. I mean, we cannot wait uh, 15 years to, to see the results of these education policies. We have now, right now, 130 million informal workers, and there is demand, at least in certain, in certain uh, occupations. So, so I think involving probably the private sector, both designing and doing the training, more that, that we are that they are doing right now would be the policy that will do from o o over the self. Only informality is another issue. I mean, I, I think it may be a little bit longer to to, to tackle. Uh, I would advise the the IDB's work: uh, uh, better pensions, better jobs. Uh, disclaimer: I'm one one of the co-authors, but uh, but there we 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 analyze why we see inequality so high and how to to address it through monetary incentives, but also through channels, because today uh, fulfilling the, the obligations of, of labor and also pensions are, 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 are not really adequate to the type of labor force that we have. We are not German continental industrial workers, uh, but we are people who move from one jobs to the others, but we imported the, the pension and social insurance schemes from continental Europe. That makes uh, 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 no sense. And the last uh, port on commodity, well, that's, that, that, that's really the report coming. <laughs> no, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a crucial question, I mean, but we have different effects. Uh, the first one on uh, all these commodity rents actually pointed to the question of sustainability. Many of us would, would ask us, I mean, all these social policies were, were, were actually, and pro-growth, pro, sorry, pro-poor social policies were actually um, feasible because there were resources that now they will stop being there. But on the other hand, uh, there is a lot of rents uh, which are not distributed really evenly uh, of these commodity booms. We have the regalia system when we have some efforts to redistribute the things. So maybe there are less rents. And so the inequality would be lower because the rents were concentrated. But then to, to complicate more the things, you have the formal and the, and the informal commodity sector, which matters, and for which uh, I have to say I have no, no data so far. So very good questions to, 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 to monitor, and, and thank you very much for your comments. Okay, wow, this is uh, <laughs> hard going with all of these difficult questions. Okay, so policy priorities, if you were the president of a country and had money, what would you do first? You know, I think uh, when it comes to social equity, uh, fiscal policy is crucial. So the first thing I would do is I would make sure that y your fiscal policy does no harm. I would check to make sure that uh, at least my expenditure patterns are not regressive in their impact. And um, one big regressive element in our, f in our, in our fiscal uh, structures tends to be uh, subsidies for fuels. And so one, one easy thing to do in the current environment would be take advantage of what's happening with oil prices to 
reduce, eliminate uh, these very regressive fuel subsidies, which in countries like Ecuador are equivalent to 6, 5 percent of GDP, and they go mainly to the people that have large swimming pools and want to hit them with cheap gas. So do no harm in the fiscal side. Then, of course, you have to start working on your resource mobilization side. We, it has to do with, uh, with taxes and how you tax. And um, in Latin America, with the exception of Argentina and Brazil, has very low taxation, uh, very low, low uh, a fairly uh, low resource mobilization. So you, we have a challenge there where we have to convince people put, to pay more taxes. Nobody wants to pay more taxes any place in the planet. So how you convince them to be part of a citizenship process where you pay taxes and in exchange you can demand higher quality public services. But a lot of the inequality agenda is going to be based on the ability to erase the quality of basic public services, education, security in the streets, pensions, health. That costs money. And so you need people to enter into this virtual circle of pain and demanding improvements, which I don't know if anybody knows. I mean, I keep on asking politicians, how do you do that? And I haven't gotten a, a good answer so far yet because it's the toughest thing in public policy uh, to, to get people to pay, to pay so that you have a, so that the benefits are not necessarily to the person that pays individually, but for, so, for society as a whole. Then I really think that uh, education is a huge agenda in Latin America. Finally, the education agenda in Latin America is not about quantities, but about quality. And, and, uh, and my, I always say this, but you know, the fact that Latin America is no longer as worried as it used to be in the past about the next financial crisis and whether you, the, the mic macroeconomy will implode, is allowing people to think about good stuff. So I think Latins are creative and over the next 10 years, I think we will learn a lot about how to improve the quality of education, how to do better on the productivity side, what to do with infrastructure, because we're not so worried about the next financial crisis. We finally are talking about growth and human capital and so forth. And if you look at, for instance, our most recent publication on the quality of teachers, I was amazed and encouraged to see that we are learning a lot how to improve the quality of teachers over periods relatively short. Three, five years. I always thought that you know, to improve the quality of teachers, you had to wait until the next generation because to get good teachers, you, get, you need good teachers today, but to, you don't have good teachers today, so how are you going to get good teachers in the future? It seemed like a 25-year thing. And we are finding out that with smart policies and using the fact that there is always some good teacher somewhere, even in the poorest schools, that you can mobilize mentoring and other activities and incentives to improve quality of teachers is crucial. So we're starting to learn how to improve the quality of education. We are far from what we need, but it seems to me that is a hugely important agenda in the region. And it's sweeping throughout Latin America. Education reforms are taking place in Mexico, they're taking place in Peru, they're taking place in Colombia, Chile, and, and the community of practitioners and reformers in the education equality is expanding, and all of us are doing more research on that. One, with one important research we're studying is on the quality of tertiary education, which involves all of these complicated issues as to community college, trade schools, uh, high-class universities, integration to the centers of excellence in the U.S., which are very important issues. So we have, we have big agendas there. There's the issue of formality, where, where we have come with a complementary view to that of the IDB and Santiago Levy. You know, traditionally, the issue of formality has been seen from the point of view of uh, the SOTO approach. You know, there's a lot of informal people because they have not very well established property rights. We need to give them title to the land and we need to create all sorts of programs to support the small so that they can become bigger and become formal. We have come up with a view that's complementary but different because the evidence is so striking that informality gets reduced big time when larger firms grow and generate jobs. So the idea that you can reduce informality by helping the small become informal normally leaves you, gives you little bang from the back compared to finding what is blocking your larger enterprises from generating employment. It is the growth in the formal sector, the larger enterprises, the job generation there that brings people from the informal sector into formality. That seems to be the biggest effect. So for me, the informality agenda is really a growth agenda. Uh, unlike many people 
uh, thing. So that's, that's an informality. On Sam's question, I think you're absolutely right that there's this incredible reduction in the urban to rural wage gaps. It's throughout all of Latin America. A paper that Chico Ferreira is now completing shows the remarkable reductions in the wage gaps between urban and rural that has happened in Brazil. But it's happening all over the place. There are papers on Peru that show that even in the rural areas, people that have not migrated to the urban areas, the rural areas are making more money and better wages. There's some sort of ongoing commercial integration and production integration in some of these rural areas. So that, I think, is a fascinating area of study because we were not used to seeing this. And, uh, all, and, and in, a, in, in societies that are already highly urbanized, that this thing is happening is, I think, I think remarkable. Uh, the final point I want to make about uh, e education e quality progress, I think we have to take very seriously what has happened in Chile and Brazil. People have gone to the streets, and they have gone to the streets not to protest about the last fiscal adjustment, which was the tradition. We used to go to the streets to, to get angry for the government for raising gasoline prices and things like that. People are going to the street demanding better transport systems and better education systems and so forth and so on. Those are demands from a new social structure in Latin America, which I think is the best news I have seen for many years, that the type, the, the content of what we're protest, protesting about has changed. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, I was recently in, in Uruguay and I was fascinated to see talking to labor union leaders and Congress people and politicians, how there has this huge consensus has formed that the biggest agenda for Uruguay going forward is gonna be raising the quality of education for all. Uh, and that's not easy. Think what's happening in Chile. The biggest debate in Chile is that in this big effort to expand education at all levels to everybody, Chile seems to be risking a big decline in quality. To get in this right is very difficult. To get coverage expansion together with quality is, is, is a big thing, and both things are needed in, in Latin America. Great. Um, thanks to you both. I'll follow your example and announce a forthcoming report on uh, the politics of progressive taxation in Latin America with five case studies and some lessons for reformers that should be out in a matter of weeks. We're correcting the page proof, so uh, we look forward to sharing that. Thank you for joining us. Please join me in thanking our excellent panelists. periodista de Voice of America, pero no te vayas, ¿ok? Yeah.